Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our morning service. We are going to start with prayer as usual to yeah, just come into the presence of the Lord that is so precious in the house of God. So, Father God, I thank you so much that you are here for us every day. You encounter us wherever we go. You are ready to meet us and you wait for us usually to encounter you. And Lord, today we want to express this desire to meet with you, Lord. Meet with us. We are ready to hear. We open our, we want to open the windows of our hearts, the doors of our hearts to welcome you. We want to be ready to receive your word. And I ask you, Lord, please speak through me. Please just let everyone be filled with your word, with what you have for them today in a measure that you have prepared for them, Lord. And I thank you that you're good and that you're worthy and mighty and powerful and worthy to be praised. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. When I was preparing for the MBA t test recently, I was thinking about what to ask the students. And in one of the, the lessons, we talked about the Holy Spirit. It was Pentecost and we talked about how um, he descended from heaven and how he was display displayed in flames on the disciples' heads. And then I thought about how interesting it is that the Holy Spirit only ever works in and through people. So nowhere do we read that the Holy Spirit suddenly became visible and performed miracles himself, thinking, okay, this person is taking too long. I will now do everything myself. Instead, he always partners and cooperates with people, with a person. And this can happen in very different ways. We can um, see it in the Bible, and we want to look at four examples of it today. So let's first read a scripture from Judges 6, 25 to 27. That night, the Lord said to Gideon, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old. Pull down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord had commanded. But he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. A few verses later, in Judges 6, 34, we read, Then the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. He blew a ram's horn as a call to arms, and the men of the clan of Ebezer came to him. So according to this scripture, the Spirit of the Lord took possession of Gideon after Gideon had already had an encounter with the angel um, of the Lord. You can read the whole story in Judges 6 to 8. Furthermore, the Lord had given him a commission, namely to overthrow the altar of Baal and Asherah and build an altar to the Lord in their place. Gideon carried out the Lord's command by night so as not to be seen, but he was obedient. So he said yes to what the Lord had asked of him. And then the spirit of the Lord possessed Gideon and he was filled with supernatural courage, gathered an army, and delivered Israel from the rule of Midian and Amalek. So we see that obedience, an act of Gideon's will, preceded the Holy Spirit filling and empowering him to liberate the people of Israel. The next scripture we want to read um, in this light is in 2 Kings 6, 1-7. One day, the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, as you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. Let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. There we can build a new place for us to meet. All right, he told them, go ahead. Please come with us, someone suggested. I will, he said, so he went with them. When they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. But as one of them was cutting a tree, his axe fell into the river. Oh, sir, he cried, it was a borrowed axe. 
Where did it fall? The men of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it into the water at that spot. Then the axe head floated to the surface. Grab it, Elisha said, and the man reached out and grabbed it. So if you ever were at a lake or at the sea and you dropped something into the water, like it happened to me before, then you know things don't float easily. <laughs> they only float if they are lighter than the water surface. And one time I was at the, at the bird sea and um, my um, towel decided to make its way outside of the boat I was in and I expected it to float because I was thinking of this story. But unfortunately, either I didn't pray fast enough or the towel had decided that it wanted to go down to the ground and it did not come up and did not float. And I was a bit surprised because I thought the ax was, was floating in the Bible, so why is my towel not floating? But well, I'll try next time. But here you can see that the Holy Spirit worked through Elisha, a prophet of God who had also surrendered his will to God. He works miracles through us, even overriding the laws of nature and providing practical help in a time of need, because practically, of course, it's impossible for an axe to float. And looking at the Old Testament, there are countless other examples. Moses, Joshua, Samson, Samuel, David, all of them were filled by the Holy Spirit. But this intimacy of relationship was not available to the Israelite people in whole, or as a whole as we know it today. Instead, it was individuals, committed individuals, who loved the Lord, who sought to live with him, through whom the Holy Spirit worked. In the New Testament, it's a very different story. In Acts 2, we read how the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples, and they were able to speak in other languages, so that the inhabitants of the countries whose languages they spoke could understand them. Let's read a scripture in Acts 19, 1 to 6, which tells us a very similar story. It tells us that the Holy Spirit also fell on other disciples, and I know that many of us have experienced exactly what it says there. So let's read. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you re receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience? He asked, and they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. prophesied. So this shows us how Paul met some disciples in Ephesus, people who wanted to get closer to God. They wanted more by firstly, turning from their evil ways and by secondly drawing closer to God, experiencing the baptism of John. They had received this baptism already, this first um, level, so to speak, of baptism, but they had not heard about the Holy Spirit yet. After Paul told them about Jesus, they got baptized in the name of Jesus. So we see that they said yes to the next step in their relationship with God. They made a clear decision to move forward with him. Afterwards, Paul laid his hand on them and prayed, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in other languages. So also here, we see that somebody has to say yes. They have to agree to um, the work of the Holy Spirit in them and with them, and then he will act. In Galatians 5, 22 to 23a, it even says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we look at this, we can see a clear common thread in the Bible. 
God, how he draws closer to man, and how he draws man closer to him. In the Old Testament, his presence and the work of the Holy Spirit is only reserved for individuals through whom he worked mightily and performed miracles when they placed their life at his disposal. But in the New Testament, he sends Jesus Christ to enable access to himself through the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross and the resurrection from the dead. After we gain access to him, we are able to receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does not just work superficially and impersonally as some higher power, so to speak, which is not tangible but, or impersonally, but he works personally in us. He works on a spiritual level, blessing us with the gift of tongues or other spiritual gifts, but he also works the fruits of the Spirit very personally in each and every one of us. When we read this again, love and joy and peace, patience, kindness and goodness, faithfulness, forbearance and self-control. When we think about these qualities, we think of a person that's lovely and very pleasant to be with, right? Someone who displays these qualities is a loving person and a person who is being loved. A person that's probably, that probably does not have a lot of issues in their interpersonal relationships. So the Holy Spirit not only works in and through us, but also very personally in and for us by transforming us into the image of God and to become more like him, and in this way also to become a socially compatible person, so to speak. But what does all of this have to do with our theme for this year, love? What all these biblical passages have in common is that the Holy Spirit only works when a person reaches out to him, draws near to him, and says yes to his work in and through them. Almighty God exposes himself to the will of each individual to cooperate with him. He, the living God, is waiting for us to say yes to his work in and through us. What a humility. It's so impressive. He would have had every right to turn away from us and to exalt himself above us because he is perfect and holy and pure. But instead, you know, at the same time, this means that he being the almighty God, he could have decided to create people as kind of two dimensional beings that have no other choice but worship him, that have no other choice but to say yes to everything he asks of them. But instead, he has created us. <laughs> We are able to choose him. We are able to um, subdue our will to his. We are able to choose him, to say yes to his work in us. I think it just so strikes me, you know, he, he basically makes himself so vulnerable. He ex exposes himself to us ignoring him, being against him, not appreciating him. Yeah. It just strikes me because he is so amazing and so wonderful, and yet he says, I will humble myself, so to speak, and wait for your yes, human. I think that's also amazing as to when it comes to how he sees us, you know, how powerful he has made us because he wants to partner with us. I think that's beautiful. And this is love. This is love. The Almighty God lowers himself by sending Jesus Christ to this earth. He reveals his heart in the most loving way by sending his son to die for us, for our sins, for our um, iniquities, for our sicknesses, for our poverty, for everything that the enemy has thrown at us in order to keep us far away from him. But instead, Jesus Christ was sent here and he goes all the way to the cross. He dies. He um, gets resurrected from the dead and opens this access to the Father because the Father loves us and he, like he loves us and he draws closer to us and draws us closer to him. This yes, the first yes, so to speak, when we decide to walk with the Lord is only the start of a wonderful adventure we will embark on when we get to know him step by step. James 8 places this in very clear words. It says, 
oh, James 4, verse 8, sorry. It says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. I love this principle because it is a promise also. And we can just reach out and say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. I'm ready. Use me. And he will. So I would like to encourage us today to say yes to him with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, and with all of our strength. Yes, I want to live with you, Jesus. Yes, I want to give you all of my life. Yes, I want to be your child, Heavenly Father. Yes, I want you to live in me, Holy Spirit. And yes, I want to experience wonderful, humanly impossible things with you. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that we can see how relentlessly you pursue humanity through all the ages, through miracles and works and um, by sending your son, how you see people, how you work in people, how the good plans you have for them, Lord. All of this is so full of love, full of kindness, full of mercy, Lord. And I ask you to open our hearts to see the full measure of it, because there is so much more that we can already see now. And Lord, I thank you that you are there to be met. We really want to meet with you, and we just want to say yes. We are here, Lord, and we want to get to know you better. We want to yeah, walk more closely with you. Please encounter every single one of us when we now go into our day. Um, yeah, please just meet us with your love, with your kindness, with your guidance, with your wisdom, with your power. And I thank you that um, yeah, we will reconvene and tell each other great miracles and testimonies about what you did in our lives. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.